All right, so you may recall at the beginning of this video series, I said that uh, I actually went out to buy the one item, the Hickok transistor tester, and I ended up picking up two other items. Of course, the funky old Hickok uh, space command <laughs> uh, frequency counter. And what was the third item? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was this boat anchor. Tektronics oscilloscope. When I first spotted this laying on the floor, uh, I got mildly excited in the hopes that it was a curve tracer for uh, analyzing transistors and other semiconductors. Unfortunately, it was just an oscilloscope. And I'll tell you, I had very little interest in this thing. This is a model 5440, so it's pretty early. It was probably quite expensive back in its day. It's massive, not as big as the like the 575 uh, series of scopes that they had back in the day, which were vacuum tube with big fans in them. Um, but notice the cord is cut off. So he offered me this for 10 bucks, and the sucker that I am, I went for it. Now this gentleman was just a picker. He didn't know anything about electronics, and he was getting his stuff from another picker. So. Uh, who knows how many hands this changed, how many times this changed hands before he got a hold of it. But his point was that it's entirely conceivable that the guy who had it before him cut the cord off just so he could put it in a pile of scrap for copper down the road. And that, in other words, there's a possibility this thing actually works, and the guy didn't know what to do with it, so he cut the cord off. Eh, <laughs> well... I wonder. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this line fuse. And you know what? That fuse is not blown. So that bodes well. So before we go through the trouble of opening this up to put a new line cord on it, let's just splice one on. Interesting choice of color code here for these wires. This actually says instruction, oh, instrument set for VAC, and then this says 120. But you could actually pop this off and set it for 110, or 200, or 220, or 240, or 100. So, there must be a transformer with taps on it that you can change. Yeah, so here we go right here. It says, caution to change line voltage, refer to manual. Primary tap set for 120 AC volts. So underneath this cover is probably access to the primary windings of the transformer and different taps you can set. M-I-C-K-E-Y. Yeah, I know. Hey, does anybody say that anymore? Mickey Mouse job? Anyways, I'm not really worried about it. I got the... Uh, fix all for it right here just to be clear I did use crimp connectors and I have no exposed conductors on either the line or the neutral that last wire you saw they are the green one that's just the ground so at least I'm hooking it up so the chassis will be grounded this is the uh plug that I had hanging around here so let me show you one other thing on the back of this before I flip it around and see if the smoke pixies will come out check this label out right here federal signal core property number so that looks to me like I don't know this might have been in government service really small print it says notify accounting department if sold or moved we get a nice wide shot in case smoke starts pouring out of the top all right, where's the on button on this pig? Let's see. Lots of times it's disguised as a, oh, actually it's a pull. Whoop. All right, that doesn't seem right. I'm beginning to think I know why this wasn't uh, turning on for somebody. So this long, long rod is supposed to go all the way to the near the rear there or somewhere inside deep inside this thing and uh, attached to a, a switch 
All right, so we're not going to be able to do anything until I open it up and see where that's supposed to be. Now, this couldn't be easier to get into. Ah, the fourth one is covered with a sticker warning me that the calibration will be void if I open this up. And it was calibrated. It looks like it might be 7 slash 7 5. Looks like it may have been calibrated back in 1975. So it might be due. Ta da! So the switch seems fine, just the uh, plastic doohickey that is supposed to clip that onto the switch has appears to have broken. All right, so it's just a plastic piece that's cracked right here. Um, but I think, well, I'm almost willing to bet that I could make this work with a plastic wire tie. Yeah, I agree. It's sketchy, but it'll get us through these uh, few tests to see whether or not this is a paperweight. Now, some of you guys are probably thinking, Steve, couldn't you have just reached down into here and pulled that knob to turn it on manually for the little bit of testing you want to do to see if this thing's any good? Well, yeah, I could have done that, except for one thing. You notice what's right near here? This cover says danger high voltage. And this big red wire right here is the high voltage anode lead going up to the CRT. So chances are the insulation on that should be pretty good, but I don't really feel like having my hand here when I turn this on in case this generates high voltage right away. And in case there's like, you know, something in the insulation there, like it's dried out and there's a crack in it somewhere I didn't see. But the electrons find it and chase me down ruthlessly. Okay. Switch is off. Plug in. Okay. Nothing happening yet. I'm not surprised. It looks like the way this is wired, the line cord power comes in, goes right through the line fuse, and then comes directly over to this switch. And then out the switch. So this switch, basically, when this switch is off, there's virtually no power inside most of this thing. All right. Here goes nothing. Okay. I hear absolutely nothing going on. And I see nothing going on. So appearances are that this thing is dead, dead, dead. Ah. You know, when I pulled this fuse out and took a quick look at it, it looked okay. But when you turn it around on this side, I see that little tiny wisp of gray that it signifies to me that there was some sort of an event. I bet you this fuse is open. Fuse is open. I wonder what size fuse this is. This is a one and a quarter amp slow blow fuse, and that is what the rear panel calls for, is a 1.25 amp slow blow. All right, I look through my slow blow fuses and I don't have a one and a quarter amp slow blow. I have a one amp slow blow and then I have the next size up is a two amp. If I put the one amp in and blows, it's not going to really tell me much. The rush of current when you first power this thing up might be enough to take out a one amp even if it's working normally. Two amp is significantly larger in amperage, so not the greatest idea, but my suspicion is that there's probably a short in the power supply, and I think it's going to blow this fuse rather quickly anyways. Um, I don't think it's going to sit there and cause this thing to cook and do more damage. 
which is what you would normally worry about in this kind of a situation. So, I'm going to install a new fuse. Pretty much nothing. Now, and check that fuse. <laughs> Do you see what I see? Does it look like there's nothing in there? It's because the entire guts of the fuse vaporized. It's actually a fine spray of vaporized metal on the glass now. This is what we call a hard short. Or a dead short. Which I like. Dead sh short's far more easy to diagnose than a... Uh, Intermittent or a high resistance short So cool bean. Well, I took the easy to remove cover off of this side and Doesn't give me that much more access. I'm trying to get to this board right here because I'm looking at these big filter capacitors and This board is screaming power supply. I mean to say it is screaming to me that it is the power supply Two-sided board. Oh, stinkers. All right, let me show you what I'm doing here. Uh, I don't have a schematic for this thing. And uh, I could probably get one online, but again, I don't want to get too deep down this rabbit hole, although I usually end up doing that anyways. But I can do some really basic checks, and I can kind of figure out some of the stuff that's going on here without a schematic just by looking at this thing. First off, I know that this is a bridge rectifier. So this is four diodes in a bridge configuration inside one package. And here is another one. So I'm looking at two DC supplies minimum, okay? And usually on these packages, the two inner pins are where the AC input is. So if I check with my ohmmeter across that, I get low resistance, which is not surprising because I'm probably looking at the winding of the transformer. Then we could clearly see a plus right here and a minus right here. So this is where the DC out outputs from the bridge. Now if they are looking for just a DC supply, oftentimes this will go to ground. The negative will go to ground and we'll just get a positive voltage out of this side. But lots of times they're using the bridge rectifier to generate both a plus and a minus supply. So that could be a possibility there. So I have no reason to believe that this isn't set up the same way. And so I look at this configuration and I see also that there are one, two, three, four, and there's one up underneath here. There are, I'm sorry, right here, five. There are five large filter capacitors, these big metal cans that are in this thing. All right. So what I noticed is if I just do some real rudimentary resistance checks, if I find a known ground, which in this case the chassis is a known ground, and I go to the outputs on these bridges, and I look at the resistance measurements. Let me get my meter up here so you guys can see what I'm looking at. And I'm just looking, okay, I see that that's going up. Alright, and it goes to infinity, so that's a cap that's probably charging that's probably just a bad connection I just had there these are probably just the capacitors charging up nothing that interesting there on that one if I come over to this small bridge and I go to the positive side see how low that is and how it tends to just sit there at like 53 ohms if I come to the negative side I see more of what I expect to see. And as a matter of fact, if I change the polarity on the meter, I could probably get the cap, the cap to charge. Yeah, so you just see the cap charges and then it goes to infinity, which is what I would expect. So I'm seeing an unusually low resistance on this positive output of the bridge. You can see now it's like 17.2. Now the resistance between, between the pins on the bridge, they're not so great, but it's not a dead short like I would expect. 
if the bridge was bad. So what I'm suspecting is I'm suspecting that we've got a filter capacitor that's gone bad here. So now I look at, well, how is this uh, circuit wired? I can see that the negative comes right out of the bridge and goes over on this trace and goes to this pin on this filter capacitor and this pin on the filter capacitor. They're tied together. And then this pin is not. So, okay. So I'm looking at two sections inside one capacitor. This is common to the two sections. But look, it's also common to this. So that makes me think, because of the fact that this other capacitor over here on this side, which consequently on the other side of the board, uh, this pin I believe right here goes right to here. Or is it this one? Well, it doesn't really matter. The point is, if I look at this center pin on this cap to here, I get a normal reading. But when I go on this one, I get that super low reading. So it could be something even further down the line in the circuit that this whole side feeds that's shorted out. Or it could be the cap itself. Or it could even be the bridge, but I'm actually leaning towards the cap as being the most likely suspect because, well, capacitors are known for failure, especially big old electrolytics like that one. Well, that didn't want to come out without a fight. I really need to invest in a good solder sucker desoldering station. Uh, but, look at that. It's measuring... Uh, about 7.6 ohms and not increasing so that is a shorted capacitor luckily all that's in this whole can is one capacitor it's a 5000 microfarad at 50 volt DC all right so I don't have any 5000 microfarad 50 volt capacitors laying around I just pulled this out of an old TV chassis this is a 4700 microfarad 35 volt so the 4700 being a little bit lower in microfarad not so great but that'll work the bigger concern is that this is only 35 working volt and the one that I'm replacing is a 50 however usually the caps are overrated in other words the actual voltage on the circuit here isn't going to be 50 full volts it's going to be less how much less I don't know uh, I should be able to get by with running this just for a short period of time, just for testing purposes, to see whether or not this thing's got a chance of actually coming back to life. If it does, then I could invest in the proper size capacitor. It would still probably be a very small uh, capacitor like this compared you know, to this big can from way back when this thing was made. All right, here's the new plan. We're going to... I got this up on a wooden box so that that subbed in cap can hang down below and uh, that way I can have this right side up in case it actually does work. I can read the controls more easily and not only that but if that capacitor decides to go uh, ballistic um, <laughs> it'll just blow up underneath there. Um, I've seen capacitors like that turn into firecrackers so uh, all right, I've got it plugged in. I've got a new fuse in there. Let's fire it off. Got a slight dim of the lights there when I first powered it on. Just a flicker. I've got a trace. No sweep, though. All right, before I burn a hole in the... Uh, in the CRT. Let me just see if we've got something not set correctly on the front here. Okay, let's try this again. So these are the two channel inputs right here. So these are responsible for the vertical deflection and setting that. Um, so this is the time base section right here. So this is what develops the horizontal frequency. And I notice that right now it is selected over here left. 
it says left, right, and then it says line and external. That must be the trigger. All right, here we go. Display mode. Trigger after delay. Delayed sweep. Intense sweep. And main sweep. And main sweep is what we want, maybe. I think there's still something sick with this thing. Radical illumination. Well, that works. There's actually lamps in there that light this up. Oh, oh, did you see that? Dirty switches. Okay, good. We can deal with that. Now that I powered it off, I'm just going to feel how warm that capacitor is getting. Oh, oh! No, just kidding. It's cool as a cucumber. Let's clean those switches. So this puppy's modular. So we can actually, it's actually a module probably went here too. Maybe, I don't know. This just comes right out. Almost looks as if this is made to slide right out. I wonder if these stickers are what are holding it in. And of course, the switches are buried in the middle. Maybe we can get to it from this side. I think I'm going to put this cover back on. Just so I don't get them mixed up. Pop this one off. There we go. Uh, no, see, that's not... Well, I mean, I'll clean these while I'm in here, but those aren't the ones I'm trying to get at. I was trying to get to these middle ones here. Ah. Uh, I mean, I guess I could unscrew this board. Maybe. I see him in there. Now, this little tiny cable right here is going to be an issue. Maybe they make that wire just long enough for you to back this board. Ah, uh, see, look what they did here. They got these ribbon cables. So this is going to open up like this. So... This cable has to be disconnected. Could just unsolder it, I know, but... I really didn't want to attempt to do that. So I wonder if I can actually get to these switches with a straw applicator on my uh, can of cleaner. Eh, that'll be flying blind. Damn it. Ha! Huh. I just happened to peek down in here between the boards and um, you guys aren't going to be able to see it probably with the camera. Maybe. But actually, the switches that I need to get to in particular are about Right about here, under this board, there's very long plastic rods like these here. There are even longer ones that go from this bank of switches right here all the way back here to the switches back there. So I can easily reach those with a um, hose applicator. And what's nice about the design of these switches is it looks like the backs of all of these switches is wide open so that uh, you can easily get the contact cleaner in there. All right, I clean these contacts right here too. These might even be gold. They might even be gold coated. Um, it's funny, before when I pulled this out, I actually looked at this quick, I thought it was a contact. Uh, this is actually just a grounding, uh, like a spring-loaded copper leaf deal there to help ground this to the case. Uh, this is interesting too. This says in marker on the side of it, it says, uh, it's kind of hard to say, but I'm pretty sure it says general signal core. So, uh, it could be general signal corporation or it could be general signal core. It could actually be a military reference 
but probably it's General Signal Corporation. I think that's what that thing on the front said, right? Well, anyways, the, the thing on the back that warned about the, uh, that had the accountant warning on there. <laughs> All righty. Give it a second for that CRT to warm up. There we go. All right, there's some sweep. Uh, let's see. Why are we not getting full scale deflection, though, on that? Oh, oh, hold on, there it is. This must be the trigger. All right, this horizontal position. Okay. And vertical position. Intensity is now working. Good. Uh, pretty sharp beam there. But that still seems to me like that should be filling. I think that's supposed to be filling the whole screen there. So we might still have something going on here. All right, I'm going to throw a probe on here and... We've got this uh, connection right here. This is to basically uh, calibrate the probe. But we can use that just to see if we get any signal. Well, that's one ugly waveform. Well, guys, I've got my, uh, my old data pulse sweep generator hooked up to this thing. And look at that. Got a nice waveform there exactly what we would expect and I also checked the second channel and the second channel works and uh, took a quick look online and it turns out yes this is another bay that's available and so if I were to get another one of these channel uh, modules in here this could be a quad channel oscilloscope the other thing that's kind of neat about this oscilloscope which made it probably a pretty big deal back in its day is there's a button here that uh, when you press it, it actually activates a little uh, cursor that you can, let's see, I thought that was the button, hold on, well, maybe I have to have it in a different mode, but anyways, there was a little cursor, you could use this right here, you can adjust the position of that cursor, so if you wanted to make like a really precise measurement using these graphical lines here which makes sense so anyways um, pretty cool old scope I did discover there was a problem with my generator over here but that's another story so I think we're gonna call this quits right here I think what I'm gonna do is I mean I'm that that capacitor is still running perfectly fine it's not even warm to the touch so I think I'm going to uh, just fix up the wiring so that I can safely have that capacitor installed in there. And uh, I'll run it like that for now. I mean, all those electrolytic cans probably should be replaced, but I think, I don't know, I think I'm going to see whether or not there's any market for this thing. I might just sell this thing. I really don't need another scope. All right, so I uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching this video, and uh, if you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing.